fire. Let's pray. Yes, Lord, our lips praise you. And we would praise you now, Lord, with our attention as we seek to understand and know more of your word and to understand how it is that you interact and work with us. Lord, we live in confusing times. I think of all the, the violence that's happening in the Middle East, Lord, with missiles and, and, and drones falling down, with all the fighting, so many homeless, so many hurt, and so much anger. Lord, only you can bring peace to that area, can bring peace to those people. So, Lord, we pray for them, the people that are living in this suffering and conflict, more than we could even begin to understand and ask that you would in the midst of that lord somehow break through and help them to feel your presence and a peace that can only come from you lord i pray for all those in our congregation who are going through times of illness or who are dealing with difficult circumstances in their life lord again only you can really bring peace only you can really bring the health and the healing and the wholeness that we need. But Lord, I pray for those that are going through that now, that uh, your presence, your spirit, and uh, your work would be apparent in their lives so that they could truly know that uh, you are God and you are watching over them. Lord, I pray for our community. There are so many driving by this place of worship right now, Lord, that don't know you. There are people that live next to us on our streets, that uh, work in the cubicles next to us, or sit in the classrooms next to us, Lord, that don't even have an idea that you exist. Lord, and I pray that um, you would take us and use us as a way to change that, and that we could bring your presence into their lives. Uh, so now, Lord, be with us in this time and we thank you for your presence here and in our lives in jesus name we pray amen so i would invite you all now to stand for the reading of scripture um, as is our custom and uh, at this point the elder will read in white and the congregation will read in the yellow and he said to them And after six days, Jesus took, him, took with him Peter, James, and John, and led them to a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what, was, what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, Why did the scribes say that the first verse of Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things, and how it is written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. May God bless the reading of his word. To be seated. So when they asked me to preach, they gave me this topic, and uh, I had to, ooh, sorry about that up there, I had to do a lot of studying, 
and understanding what was going on in this passage. And there is a whole lot of Jewishness going on. But we probably miss most of it because we're not Jewish. Um, I also had to confess it didn't answer one of my questions. The biggest question I had about this passage that went unanswered was, how did they know it was Moses and Elijah? Did they wear name tags? I don't know. So I don't have an answer for that part. Okay? So the first verse says, he says, in true, and, and this verse... This is kind of an odd verse. This verse caused a number of people trouble, and I'll talk about it a little bit first. Uh, it kind of seems almost like a throwaway verse when it's in there. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now a lot of people think this refers to when Christ comes again, second coming. So the problem is, if that's true, the second coming hasn't happened yet, and all those people have died. So that people, some people who don't like dealing with or believe in the, the veracity of scriptures, they'll take this and say, see, this is, Jesus is making a prophecy here, and that prophecy didn't come true. Okay? So there's a number of ways you can look at this, but I think the answer is in the very next verse. It says, and after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and then it up a pie to the mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. They're getting to see the glory of God six days later. Okay? Some people will say or argue that maybe this was when he ascended into heaven. But either way, there were disciples, there were people around who did get to witness God's glory in terms of his first coming, but did not yet get to see his glory at the second coming which we all wait for anxiously. So now, this is kind of getting into what I somewhat sacrilegiously think of as special effects Jesus. Okay? So, as we've been doing this service on Mark, I have had an ongoing discussion with Pastor Sam that I don't agree the disciples were dense. So we tend to say he talks about and predicts he's going to die, and they don't understand it, What's wrong with them? He's told them five or six times. We forget that we know about the resurrection of Jesus because it's happened. When he was having this discussion with the disciples, they had no clue. They didn't know what it meant yet. And we're also, anybody else here who likes science fiction? Raise your hand. Okay, there's hardly any science fiction movies where somebody doesn't come back from the dead. Okay? We have been steeped in the idea of coming back from the dead. This was a new and completely foreign idea to the people back then and to the disciples, the notion that somebody could rise from the dead. I know it's going to do a lot better when they're right side up. Okay, so we have talking about the transfiguration. So it's interesting, he's got his three favorites, Peter, James, and John. We don't like to think that Jesus played favorites, but he had three favorites, definitely. You see it if you keep reading through the scriptures. And these weren't necessarily just his favorites, but these were people that he poured the most into. So he had, you have it when he had a uh, talk, and he was talking to me 5,000, 4,000 people, and they got to hear him speak. Then you have times when he's gathered with all his disciples, his followers. Then you have times where he just has the 12 disciples, or who we call the apostles. And a lot of times you have just these three that he's pouring the most of himself into, that he's discipling them. He's giving them all the details and all the good stuff. So when he's transfigured, it says, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, so no one on earth could bleach them. I don't, I don't know if they had bleach back then. And that's kind of just how we translated the verse to try and get the sense of what it's talking about. Uh, but I don't think they were really bleached, but it's telling us how white they became. So they're on a mountaintop experience. So some of you ladies will recognize yourself in this picture here. This is when you were at Mount Hermon, just a couple, few weeks ago. So who was in Mount Hermon? Raise your hand. Okay. It's a mountaintop experience. You go off and you expect something big and something good to happen because you're focusing on God. You're there with people focusing on God. You're praying and ready to hear from God, just like Jesus had taken these disciples up on the mountaintop. Here's another mountaintop experience. 
uh, the guy in the red jacket on your right, standing up there, that's me when I was about 14 or 15. I honestly don't remember exactly how old I was. Where I am is on top of Mount Whitney, tallest mountain in the continental United States, 14,495 feet. Our scout troop had gone on a hike. There's a base camp not too far below here where we stayed overnight. And our scoutmaster let the older scouts, of which I was part, he let us get up early in the middle of the night and hike up to the top of the mountain so we could see the sunrise. I don't know why that made me emotional. <laughs> uh, now, the problem with a 14 or 15 year old person is they don't think to take pictures of the sunrise because they're 14 or 15. So this is looking down. The base camp is kind of down there. This is when you're looking at the top of Mount Whitney, you can actually look down into Death Valley. So you can look from the highest point in the continental United States to the lowest point. This is some of our troop coming up later after we'd been up there a while. And uh, you can just see forever and you feel like you could touch the clouds. So I'm willing to take a guess that for all the people in here, I get the prize for the highest mountaintop experience. Okay, unless any of you else been up there, okay? We go up there and we expect to have emotion and have feeling and to have things happen. We like going up to the mountaintop. We can get away from it all, forget the world, and see what's going on. So while they're up there, it says um, that there appeared to them Elijah and Moses and they were talking with Jesus. Now what is it about mountains? Mountains are a big thing if you're Jewish. You may not realize that, but they are. So there's Moses on the mountaintop. That's the mountaintop is where he went and got the instructions for building the tabernacle, and we're going to talk about that a bit more here. They got the law or the Ten Commandments. Moses got the law and Ten Commandments up on top of Mount Sinai. And he got to almost see the glory of God. And we'll talk some more about that. Here it says, Moses on top of the mountain. This is Exodus chapter 33. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all of my goodness pass before you, that's the Lord, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. You couldn't see the face of God and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you will see my back, but my face you shall not see. I can't imagine Moses going through that experience and how that must have felt to him. And can you imagine the glory of God is such that you can't look at him face to face? that Moses couldn't look at him face to face and live. The other person is there is Elijah. We have Elijah on the mountaintop. Okay, so Moses is kind of the law, and Moses represents the law to the Jewish people. When you say law, you mean Moses. When you say Moses, you mean the law, and that's critical for the Jewish faith. Well, Elijah, on the other hand, he's the prophet. When you read about the top prophets, he's on top of the list. There's him on Mount Carmel, and which I somewhat again sacrilegiously call the Baal barbecue in rain. So he had the great competition with the prophets of Baal. And he said, we're both going to give an offering. So you give your offering and pray to your God to light your offering and take your offering and consume it with fire. And after much taunting, nothing happened. And then he had his offering ready, and he said, fine, douse it with water seven times. And Baal, all by, or Baal, Elijah, all by himself prays, and the fire of God comes down and consumes his offering. And then Elijah goes and kills all the prophets of Baal in this huge confrontation. And after that, this great and glorious win for God, 
he gets worried because the king and the king's wife especially want to kill him. So he goes running off to Mount Horeb. Interesting, some of the um, passages, some of the commentaries that I was reading about the transfiguration, there's speculation as what mountain Jesus took them to. And some are saying that maybe Jesus took them even to Mount Sinai or to Mount Horeb. And some of the different commentaries kind of discuss whether Mount Sinai and Horeb are actually the same place. When he's there, he speaks with God. Could you imagine that, talking directly to God and hearing his voice back? He actually speaks to you verbally, audibly. There's a wind, God's voice isn't in the wind. There's the earthquake, God isn't in the earthquake. There's the fire, God isn't in the fire. And finally, Elijah hears the word of God, the voice of God, in a low whisper. He's experienced God's presence. He just gets to hear the voice. He doesn't even get to see the glory of God. So this is how that story goes. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke it in pieces and the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, the earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. God doesn't always appear to everyone in the same way. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave, and behold, there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? So that's all wrapped up in this. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. He's got the law, and Jesus has got the prophet. But in the midst of the law and the prophet, God's face in Jesus showed with glory. Moses didn't get to see that when he was on Mount Sinai. Elijah didn't get to see that when he was on Mount Horeb. But now, not just Moses, not just Elijah, but Peter, James, and John all get to see the glory of God. They get to see Jesus shining with the glory of God standing in his presence. There has been a fundamental shift here in how we relate to God and how God relates to us. We know that because we know the end of the story. We know the resurrection and we know what comes. But these guys don't know really what all that means yet. They just know that there is Jesus standing in a way they could never have imagined but there he is. So who appeared in glory? Oh, this part here in Luke, the reason I'm bringing up Luke is it tells us what they talked about. So it says, Jesus was talking with Elijah and Moses, appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he is about to accomplish in Jerusalem. He's talking to Moses and Elijah about his crucifixion and his resurrection. Things they couldn't have even imagined when they were alive. And again, Peter, James, and John are there to hear about it. That's pretty, pretty amazing, and I can't imagine what it would have been like to be there with them. My wife told me I had a lot of slides, so we'll see how we're doing here. <laughs> Oops. So now it tells us, Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we were here let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. This seems pretty silly to us, okay? But it's also very, very Jewish, okay? If you think about it, every time something happened between God and Israel, what did they do? They put up a monument. Joshua crosses the river, put up a monument of rocks. When, when they are celebrating going back to Jerusalem, they put up a festival of booths. They put up booths where they can remember what God has done in bringing them back to Jerusalem after an exile. They like to have 
places tied to their memories of God. And often they go to places to remember that. One of the struggles that Jewish people have now is they don't have the temple anymore. And the temple was where they went to do their business with God. But we need to remember as going back, that temple used to be something called the tabernacle. A tabernacle is just a big fancy tent. But it's a tent where you go to meet God. When Moses was up on the mountain, he got instructions on how to build this tabernacle and how they would take it. And later on, they even call it the tent of meeting. It's the place where the people of Israel could go and make their sacrifices and where they could go and meet with God. The tabernacle is a tent of meeting. Peter's just being a good Jewish boy here. Okay? Something big happens, you build a tent, you build a memorial because you want to remember. You want to be in that place so you could remember it. But also, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Okay? Again, they didn't understand all this. They just got, again, the special effects glow in the dark Jesus shining brightly with all his glory. What would you do? What would you say? Even now, knowing about the resurrection, even now knowing that Christ has promised he's coming back, if he was before you in this way, I can't even imagine verbalizing, let alone saying something that sounds dumb. And if I said something, it would probably sound pretty dumb. Okay? So the tents in the tabernacle. So remember, God is tied to places in Jewish thought. You want to know where God was. There are monuments or a way to help them remember. They remember crossing the Jordan. I told you about Jewish and his, uh, Moses and his instructions to build the tabernacle. Moses, again, the tent of meeting and the temple in Jerusalem. All these were places that they had to go to do their business with God. So he's thinking like a good Jewish man. So what happens next? And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Now we're full circle, Elijah heard the voice of God before, now he hears the voice of God again. Okay. And this also calls back to, if you remember, early in Mark, John the Baptist, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Reminding them of the baptism. I honestly don't remember off the top of my head if the disciples would have been there at the baptism. Okay? But it's calling back to that. God calling out Jesus especially, my beloved son. And he only gives them one direction. And what's that one direction? Listen to him. Listen to him. So I would think whatever Jesus has to say next must be pretty gosh darn important. Okay? There's not a lot of times in reading through Scripture where Jesus has God telling everybody to listen to what he's about to say. If you're into the whole red letter thing in the Bible, these next words should be bright red. Right after that, Suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone but, only, but Jesus only. So Moses and Elijah have gone back to wherever it is they came from, and now they just have Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he, that's Jesus, charged them, tell no one what they had seen. Could you imagine that? You just saw this. Shh, don't tell anybody. Um, who here is really great at keeping a secret? Raise your hand. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I can't imagine keeping this a secret, okay, but that's what he tells them. But he gives them a time limit, until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. So my point that I want to make here, and I think is really critical, and as we read through this, it's easy to miss, is um, the only time there was ever a command not to talk about Jesus, it had a really short statute of limitations. So you don't talk about all this stuff with Jesus until he's raised from the dead. And guess what? We just celebrated a few weeks ago. He's raised from the dead. We're not supposed to be silent anymore. No more God telling us don't say anything. 
because the time limit's passed. Jesus has already risen from the dead. So he goes on to say, they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this raising from the dead might mean. And again, it's one thing, if I told you tomorrow I was gonna play with the Philadelphia Philharmonic, you would have every right to doubt me. And that's way less crazy than rising from the dead. Okay? We forget that we know the end of the story. They don't. They don't understand it yet, and it doesn't make sense to them. So they asked him, why? they changed the subject, basically. <laughs> okay, we're tired of this dead stuff that we don't get, rising from the dead. So why do the scribes say that Elijah must first come? And he, that's again, Jesus said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things, and how it is written, son of man, that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. So all Jesus Crucifixion was all prophesied. But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. So let's talk some about Elijah. Elijah is prophesied to come before the Messiah. And biblically know that John the Baptist is thought of as Elijah. Maybe not Elijah exactly, but kind of the, the, the prototype of the representative or taking on the mission of, John, of Elijah. So I want to tell you something, though. Remember I said the statute of limitations is up? So now they're down off the mountain. Story's over, right? Second Peter, first 16 through 18, same Peter that was up on the mountain, said, For we did not follow clearly devised myths when we made known of you to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard his very born, his voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter knows the time for silence is done. We're not supposed to be silent about Jesus. We're not supposed to be silent about his glory. And we're not supposed to be silent about his resurrection. And we're not supposed to be silent about what he's done in our lives and what he can do in the lives of others. The resurrection has happened. The time for silence is past. Okay, raise your hand if you knew before I did this sermon today that you ever knew I'd been on top of Mount Whitney. How do you know I was there? Because I told you. It's really that simple. Because I told you. If I never said anything, you wouldn't know. But now I've told you and you all know and are obviously impressed with my great hiking abilities. No. <laughs> you know because I told you. There's a passage we get. Biblical translators are really good. And if you try and go about, pick apart biblical translations, you're gonna have a pretty tough time. But I'm gonna tell you, standing here, this is one where a lot of translations get it wrong. Okay? This is from Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Okay, remember that word preaching. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? That is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Okay? This is a cool verse because it outlines what we're supposed to be doing at the church, but it's also got a problem. So most of you would say, if Pastor Sam couldn't be here, if Pastor Ryan could be there, thank goodness it's Leonard up there except me, because you don't want to have to preach, okay? Well, there's a problem. The word that's the Greek there, and I'm not going to butcher the pronunciation of it, all it really means, it doesn't say preach, it just means to announce or to say something in public. There's no special connotation about doing anything in a church service with that word. 
later on, it's the same word. And tell the good news is what they translate as preach. All that word means is to tell people good news. There's no prescription about who does it, what their profession is, or where they do it, except it should be in public. Now, you could argue and say, I'm up here speaking and this is in public. But it's not really. Because we're all part of the same group and we believe. I'm just talking to people that agree with me. How hard is that? Okay? I'm not a fan of the New Living Translation, but they get this right. It says, but how can they call on him they saved unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Anybody here a someone? You all are. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? We'll get to that in a minute. That is why the scriptures say, beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So the question is, if you're here and you know the good news, who are you bringing it to? Who knows about the good news because of you? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, different passage, or a little further, pardon me, you will be blessed, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared with the defense to anyone who asks you for reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. That's saying that each and every one of us should be ready to say, this is what I believe, and this is why I believe it. Okay. having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. With this passage, I was studying this passage a few months ago. And what this passage is saying is, when I go out in the world, guess who else is in the world? Jesus. We like to talk about, okay, God's everywhere, Christ is everywhere. What really the scripture talks about is that Christ is in us. So wherever I go, he goes. It's not the same kind of I'm not saying God is omniscient and God doesn't know everything going on. What I'm saying is the presence of God is in a very particular place. God's here right now. He's not here because it's the sanctuary. He's here because we're all here. When we go out from here, God's presence will not be in this place in the same way. Because that's not the way that God works. God works within us. So I got a question. Where are you going to pitch your tent? So what do I mean by this? Remember we talked about Moses and the tabernacle, and the tabernacle was the tent of meeting? Each of us is supposed to be like a tent where God lives and other people meet him because we're there. So where are you a tent of meeting? That's the street I live on. I had a wall court. When I'm there, God's there. That's the place that I work out 40 hours a week, Lucid Motors, over in Newark. When I'm there, God's there. So where will you pinch the tent? So you, are you a place where people can see the gospel and people can hear the gospel? Because that's what we're called to do out in the world. What do you need to tell them? It's not hard. You can add this and put lots of flourishes on it. You know, it's easy to see someone like Pastor Sam get up and he's been to seminary and he knows all this stuff to do. Or we have uh, his friend Finney comes and does the apologetics thing and he knows the answer for any question we've ever had and questions we've never even thought of. 
okay? They're specialists. But you know what? You're a specialist too. You are a specialist in what God has done in your life. And that is a story that no one else has to tell. You need to know the basic gospel. It's pretty straightforward. Christ came, Christ died and paid for all my wrongs, all my sins. Christ rose from the dead. Because of that, I have promise of new life. And I, have, I accept his death as forgiveness for my sins. And I am a disciple. Now I follow him. That took like, what, 20 seconds? I, I could give you more detail, but that's it. That's the basics. And we all need to know those basics and be able to share them. But you also need your God stories. So what do we mean by that? What has God done in your life? Um, we have a, a life group. Sorry you told these people I was going to talk about them, so it's okay. Um, a, a few weeks back, maybe a month and a half or so, we were talking about how did we come to know Christ. And Tammy Sawyer and Scott Sawyer shared incredible stories of how God had touched their lives and brought them into relationship with him. It took them less than a minute. But it was moving and it touched my heart to see how God had worked in their lives. Sometime a while back, Laura Mars was in our group. And if you remember, anybody remember we had the refocus workshop and we had the different circles and about how you could share your life. And she complained and said, she didn't really have a great conversion story. But then in the next minute, went on to say how God had made such a difference in her life. We don't need a big and glorious story to share with people. We just need to say, this is, this is how God has touched my life. This is what God has done for me. And there are people that need to hear that story. I don't know who there are, because I don't live on your street. I don't work, go to school, or live in a retirement community where you live. And that's why it has to be you and your story, because you're there, and I'm not. We have to be God's people in the place where we are. So what has God done in your life? What is God doing in your life now? I'm a part of another life group, and we get around and we share a prayer request. And that's cool. But what's even cooler is when later on says, somebody says, you know that thing we were praying for? That thing we were praying for? Here's what God did. And we get to hear and see God working not 2,000 years ago, but today. You have to have those things. Because if you don't have those things, you can't share them with other people. And they won't get to know about the glory of God. It isn't hard. It's just your story, their stories, and sharing those stories. You have to practice it. You have to share it. So I'm going to plug here. If you're not in a life group, that's a great place to do it. You don't naturally do these things. If you're not doing it, you know how hard it is. Or thinking about doing it, how that could scare you. You have to, like, learn how to do it, to practice it. You have to share it with other people. I've given you some examples of the people that have been in some of the groups that I've been in. I want to tell you a little bit about where I do it, the work in the gospel. I, I did an unintentional Easter poll, uh, well, about the week before Easter. And it kind of just started, I asked a couple of people, what are you doing for Easter that I work with at Lucid Motors? Some people were like, what's Easter? And some people, I, you know, after I got a couple answers, I kind of thought, well, this is cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a drink of my tea. Um, after I asked a few people and got some kind of odd answers, I thought, now, I'm going to go around and ask everybody I can. I asked at least 30 people, what are they doing for Easter? I got everything from Easter to my kids are doing an Easter egg hunt or the kids are gone so we won't really do anything. 
Not a single person out of 30 told me they were going to church or they were going to celebrate the resurrection. Not one. And I guarantee you, if you did the same with your circle of friends beyond the church, you would get the same answer. They don't know. Why don't they know? Because nobody's told them. And that includes you. They don't know because nobody's told them. Add one other thing. So you're really not supposed to do this. I got into, I told him I was going to talk. We got into a discussion about politics and religion at work. So I was discussing at work, I do what's called business process creation. So I help, I figure out how to do stuff and draw boxes and graphs about how to get things done. So I was talking with a couple of coworkers about some stuff we were working on. And all of a sudden, one guy out of the blue, and this was a good three, four months ago, and this was in a time when a lot of you were seeing these mass shoplifting events that were going on, we're back in the news. And all of a sudden, this one guy goes, you know, with all these people stealing stuff, why do you think they're doing it? Do you think they're just bad or they're doing it because we've made it okay as a society? Okay? And he talked about it with my one friend, other friend that was there. And then he asked me what I thought. And I'll be honest, I have some opinions. Um, I had just been studying that verse that I'd shared about, you know, Christ is in me, and basically without Christ, I'm lost. And I just thought about it for a second, and I got a claim. I, this could only have been the Holy Spirit working in my life. I said, you know, I guess there could be something in terms of how they were raised. I guess there could be something in terms of how and what society is saying is okay or what you could get away with. But the reality is, I'm just as much a sinner as they are. And I need God's grace and mercy in my life just as much as they do. And that guy looked at me like, what planet are you from? <laughs> <laughs> it certainly wasn't the answer that he was expecting. And we talked a little bit more. Now I gotta confess, the guy that brought that out, I have never had another discussion with him about anything having to do with God or religion. But the other friend, we have had 12 or 15 conversations about faith and about God and about what God means to me and what God has done in my life since then. And last week when he asked what I was doing this weekend, I told him I was going to be pre preaching. And he asked me for the link, so I don't know for sure if he's watching, but hi, John. <laughs> okay? Just because I said, God's in my life. I don't know what God's going to do with that. I don't know where God's going to take that. I don't know if at some point that person will say yes to God. But now he has a chance to do it. Now he has a chance. So I guess the big thing is, yeah, it's fun to be up on the mountaintop, but as God's, as Jesus' disciples, we live life in the valley. We don't get to stay on the mountaintop. It's great to go to Mount Hermon, but the weekend's gone and you go home. It's kind of be cool to be on top of Mount Whitney, but there ain't no running water or food up there. And you can't stay up there forever. And so we come down. And it's in coming down that we need to be the place in the world where God dwells and the place where people can meet God and the place where we're willing to share God with others. Wherever it is that you live, wherever it is you work or study, wherever it is you shop, whatever it is you do in the world, remember when you go there, God's there. And people have an opportunity to meet God face to face. No special effects, just you and your story. 
about what God has done in your life. And I pray that you'll share that with them. Let's pray. God, it's real easy to kind of just go through life, try and be the person that you want us to be, to do right things and to be good. But God, the person you want us to be is a person that shares you with others. So Lord, I pray for each and every one of us today that we would praise you not just by how we come here and sing our hymns and our worship music, but praise you by sharing you with our friends, our co-workers, the people that we meet. Lord, you just were on this earth. You just walked around and met people wherever they are. And we do that every day. Please, Lord, make us into the people that are just as willing to meet those and share with them God's glory as you were willing to share God with us when you were here on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.